Welcome to worship this morning at the Church of the Incarnation. My name is Sam. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a delight to be with you, especially if you're a visitor joining us from home. Um, we're, we're very glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, so I want folks to know just right here at the start of our services that when we gather here in our church building, we've got a new ministry to kids, and I want to let everyone know uh, right at the start that uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, those children will be able to go out into the courtyard during the sermon for a special time of Bible ministry then. So I just want to put that on your radar. Uh, and if you are joining us from home uh, you can see I've got a cross coming uh, through this cross of light just behind me. If you've got a cross in your home, uh, towards the end of the service, we're going we're gonna to point at that cross. So um, find one now, put it in a prominent place where you can direct your attention to it throughout the service. Be reminded of the love of the Lord Jesus for you. So let's calm our hearts now. I invite you to set your feet flat on the floor, to rest your hands in your lap, to breathe deeply, and to settle your heart and your mind as we enter into the throne room of the heavenly king. We'll quiet ourselves now, and in a moment, I'll invite you to stand, and we'll begin. Please stand. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be His kingdom now and forever. Amen. Pray with me. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, 
all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, one of Jesus' closest friends, a person called the beloved disciple, a person who knew deeply how loved he was by the Lord. Listen to what he wrote in his first letter. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then he, the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So so do you want to know the love of Christ the way that, that John knew it? I invite you to come with me now to kneel. Let's confess our sins silently together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand up. Now listen to the way that Jesus' beloved friend, John, goes on just a few verses later. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. O come, let us adore him. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Oh, come, let us adore him.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us and make us continually to be given to all good works through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy Scripture is a feast. The Lord calls us to taste and see that he's good. So let's do that now by feasting on his word together. A reading from Isaiah, chapter 30, verses 15 through 22. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, no, we will flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away, and we shall ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuer shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five you shall flee till you are left like a flagstaff on top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. For all people shall dwell in Zion, in Jerusalem, You shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And though the Lord, and though the Lord give you bread of adversity and water of affliction, yet your, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher and your ear shall hear a word, a word behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. When you turn your, to your right or to your left, then you, will de, then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and gold metal and gold plated metal images. You shall scatter them as unclean things and you shall say, be gone, the word of the Lord. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. For we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to the death for Jesus Christ's sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentarily affliction is preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Well, my name is Wilson. I'm on staff here at Incarnation, and we are in the middle of this short sermon series on the Psalms of Ascent. It's these few psalms that are at the end of the Psalter that uh, the ancient Israelites would have taken up, uh, we think, in their journey to Jerusalem for feasts and for festivals. It was kind of the soundtrack for the journey, and God's people today can still take up this soundtrack we, we still sing these songs, we pray these prayers in our journey, in our pilgrimage through the earth, on our way to our approach to God. Um, sometimes the Bible is jarring. Sometimes it says things that kind of take us by the shoulders and shake us. Sometimes the Bible, though, really does have a very gentle word, and this is one of those. But it's, it's gentle in the, like the Mississippi River, kind of. Um, which if you go next to the Mississippi River on top, it's, um, it's very soothing. I've lived next to the Mississippi for most of my life. Um, you look at it and, it, and it calms you. It's kind of moving slowly. But of course, that river is deep and it's powerful. That's what this psalm is like in its comfort. It's gentle, but it's powerful. So when do we take hold of this psalm? At what point in our pilgrimage, in our journey, do we take up this song this prayer. We take it up when something in our life is causing us to look around frantically for help. So verse 1 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? If you're a pilgrim in Palestine 2,000, you know, or plus years ago, and you're on the pilgrimage, you look around and you see mountains. And on these mountains, you might see shrines to other gods that are offering help for just about anything you can think of under the sun. Or maybe this psalm is just good poetry and we kind of understand it naturally. I lift up to my eyes, to the hills. From, from where does my help come? Where on this journey to? When a relationship fizzles out, when you have a nasty fight with your spouse, where do you run? When a sickness or an injury strikes, when the depression won't lift, when anxiety is just there in your gut. When that happens... When you lift your eyes to the hills, where does your help come from? I want you to, this morning, if if you can, think about something that has you looking to the hills and crying for help. Maybe it's something that some trusted people know about. Maybe it's something that uh, no one really knows about, that is secret in your heart. This psalm invites us to speak the name of God into that thing. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? And the psalm answers, my help comes from the Lord. So don't let this be theoretical today. Let, it be, let this psalm speak to you where you are. Think about that thing. And then we're going to ask just one very honest question of the psalm today. And it's this. How is God the answer to our cries for help? How is God the answer to that thing you maybe were able to just identify? Um, This is normally the part where I would like tell you the three ways and then try to show you that I'm right, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, We're just going to dive right into the psalm. Uh, I want us to soak in it. I want us to see what what kind of answer this psalm has for us. Uh, Let's let's look back at verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes in the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, the Lord is called a lot of things in the Bible. Uh, He's called the Lord of hosts, uh, a rock, a king. This psalm could have 
you, the psalmist could have used any one of those uh, right here, but he chose to highlight God as the maker, the one who created the universe. Why? Why specifically talk about God as, as maker, creator here? Because when we're dying for help, the, the problem that we have looms large. It takes up our entire field of vision. And so the first thing we do is we sit at the feet of our maker and we remember there is no problem, no disappointment, no personal failing, no crushing feeling that does not pale in comparison to what the almighty God can do. There is no problem that does not cower before the feet of the maker of heaven and earth. And this is not minimizing the cry for help and saying it, it doesn't matter. No, this is bringing it to the feet of the one person who can do something about it. So how is God the answer to our cries for help? First, it's, it's because he's the colossal, transcendent power behind the universe itself. He's our help through his awesome power. Um, so I'm, I'm going to steal this story from a, uh, a pastor and a friend of mine who has kids that are a little bit older than mine. I have a son that's almost one, but he's got kids in, in their kind of elementary school age. And he said, uh, there always comes a point in every kid's life, uh, for the most part, where they go through this stage of being afraid of robbers coming in in the middle of the night. And he said, you can try sitting down with the kid and rationally explaining to them, like, the odds of a robber coming to our house while we're in it are so low. Like, you you really don't have anything to worry about. Or like, you know, they would probably break in while we were on vacation or something. Um, That won't assuage their fear at all. He said, I finally just realized what you got to do is squat down, get on their level and say, hey, do you think any robber is going to be able to get through your dad? No. No way, not while I'm in the house. And, like, that may not even be true. Like, I imagine I'll say that, not, you know, I would try my best to stop a robber, but I'm not a big dude. Um, But the point is this, in the eyes of a kid, nothing is stronger than their father. For us, that means that we have got to start by looking to our father, who actually can do something about it. We have to look to the strongest source of help instead of cycling through every other weak option until we kind of finally come to him as a last resort. It's very backwards that we do this. I do it all the time. I can rely on something literally as, as dumb as caffeine to try and fix my deep insecurities about my identity. Like, if I, if I get a caffeine high before this meeting, then I can have enough energy to like walk my way through, through my insecurities, which is totally absurd. Why, not just, why don't I just throw myself on the maker of heaven and earth and trust that he's for me? We've got to stop trying band-aids to fix broken bones just because they're easier to put on. Maybe we do that because we feel like we can't control God and we reach for something that we feel like we can get control of. We just trust that the maker of the, heaven, of the heavens and, and earth would really provide the help that we need. Which pushes us back on our question, why is God the answer to our cry for help? Sure, he's the maker of heaven and earth, but does he really care about about my cry, like my little stuff. Let's go back to the psalm. Verse 3. Um, look with me either in your bulletin or in your Bible. Verse 3 says this, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. And that word for keep Shows up six times in this little psalm. Word for keep. Uh, the Hebrew word can also mean watch over or guard. It's something God is, something God does. He is a guardian. He guards over us. So imagine a, a guard on a supposed to be walking back and forth on a parapet, watching all night long to make sure there's not a, an attack in the night. But a human guard, it's been a long day. It's two o'clock in the morning. Nothing seems to be happening. Can doze off. Can leave the city exposed to attack. Not this God. He doesn't slumber. And what is, he, what is he guarding over unsleepingly, day and night, every hour? He's guarding over his chosen people, Israel, the people of God. He's guarding over his entire chosen people all the way down to the most minute details of every single one of his children. Um, this psalm is just, this psalm is awesome because it zooms in from this huge lens 
uh, taking the whole universe in view, the God, the God, the maker of heaven and earth, and zooms all the way down to a human being's unsteady step. We lift our eyes up to the hills, but they're far away. It's like God is on our right hand, providing shade, both from the sun and from the moon. The sun, that aggressive force that can give you heat stroke, that can suck the life out of you, the things that can absolutely overwhelm you. Or the moon. Like how, does the, how does the moon strike you? You don't get heat stroke from the moon. It's something much more insidious. Ancient writers would always uh, associate emotional illness with the moon, whether they really believed that or not, or whether it was uh, just kind of a poetic device. Um, they saw the moon striking you as, as those things that are a, a lot harder to see, that inner turmoil. God will protect you from both the sun and the moon. So how is, how is God the answer to our cries for help? First, in his awesome power, but secondly, and this is wonderful, through his intimate watchful care. Remember our gospel reading. God even takes care to feed the birds. Are you not of more value than they? This is, this is the top surgeon and the owner of the hospital caring to, taking care of each and every one of his patients, even doing something as mundane as checking their blood pressure. That means if God is so intimately watchful and truly does care for us in the spiderweb intricacies of our lives, then that means that the biggest mistake that we can make is to forget that that's true. Because we can't do anything that's going to make God not be the keeper of Israel. He's covenanted himself to his people and he is absolutely faithful. There's nothing we can do that would make him fall asleep. There's nothing we can do that would rob him of his power or his care that makes him both willing and able to help. But it is possible to live like all of those things aren't true. So Eugene Peterson said it this way, we know that God created the universe and has accomplished our eternal salvation, but we can't believe that he condescends to watch the soap opera of our daily trials and tribulations. So we purchase our own remedies for that. Go to him often. The thing you think that he wouldn't be interested in, look to him for that thing. But there's still, in my mind, one more thing that nags, and that's what? That's just personal experience. It sure does feel like the sun strikes us by day and the moon by night. It feels like our foot slips. So what do we do with this? What do we do with just the experience of struggling through life? We'll look back at verse 7 we'll finish. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The Bible does not promise us cushy or carefree lives. It doesn't say that you get converted and bam, all your problems go away. Jesus is especially clear in teaching that, quite the opposite. But what scripture does promise is this, that our God will be with us and that our God will bring us through. This psalm is so, is so similar to Psalm 23, which a lot of us know really well. And what does Psalm 23 say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It recognizes the valley of the shadow of death is there. So Peterson again, uh, an entire ocean is not enough water to sink a boat, not unless the water gets in. What's promised is that God will preserve us till the end. What's promised here ultimately is, is that God will accompany us on the journey, there and back again, our going out and our coming in. When you step out the door in the morning, when you come back through it at night, or as one writer said, to the dawn and sunset of our days, God will be there. God will accompany you. He will keep you for all, from all evil. He will keep your life. From this time forth, not until the end, but without end, forevermore. So we add this one final piece to our question. How is God the answer to our real cries for help? It's finally in his steadfast guidance. So listen to Paul back from our New Testament reading. He says this. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. That's, and that's quite a list. We are afflicted. We're perplexed. God, why is this happening? Persecuted, struck down. But notice, none of it gets in. The Lord will carry you through. 
So what has you crying out for help? Even if other people might know what that thing is, no, no one fully understands the struggle we're going through deeply in our hearts. No one except one, the maker of heaven and earth, the shade on your right hand, knows. And he is your help. There is none other. Psalm 121 is there for those of us who look to the hills and would be tempted to take meandering kind of paths to try and figure out where our help can come from. Things that we think might alleviate the pain, but, but ultimately won't pull us through. It invites us to look at someone greater, God. Look at his power, his care, his guidance. And the beautiful thing about singing this psalm that has been around for thousands of years is that when we sing it today, we know something of God's power, care, and guidance that the original singers wouldn't have known. Not in full, at least. We've seen, his, we've seen his power, we've seen his care, we've seen his guidance in human flesh. In the beginning was the word, and all things were made through him, the maker of heaven and earth. And the word became flesh and dwelt with us. The maker of heaven and earth came and touched blind eyes and, and gave them sight. He touched leprous skin and healed. He forgave our sins. He died and rose again. He tied up us to himself so that we go with him in his death and we come with him in his resurrection. He will keep your life. We know what it means now. We know what it means more fully. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. And if you're with us from home, then find someone to text now or greet someone else uh, via the live stream or in your home. Now, as we come to our time of offering, uh, there are ways that you can give online, either by clicking the link here in the uh, service guide or by going to theincarnation.org, and uh, you can present your gift there on the page marked Give. Um, and as we do that, uh, or if you're just visiting with us, I invite you to offer up your souls and bodies to the Lord now. Listen to these words of the Lord Jesus, who said, it is more blessed to give and to receive.
this time of prayer, I'll lead us to focus on several different subjects. And I'm going to allow time for you to pray silently after every petition. And then once we've prayed for all of these, I'm going to allow a little bit longer for you to pray aloud for whatever joys and concerns are on your hearts this morning. And then we're going to conclude by singing the prayer that our Savior taught us. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the holy church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of our Lord's coming. Let us pray for Restoration Anglican Church in Stanton and for Jay Trailer, their vicar, that they would be a blessing to the people of Stanton, especially during that city's current time of need. Let us pray for those who do not believe and for those who have lost the faith that they may receive the light of the gospel. Let us pray for the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and for all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger that they may be relieved and protected. Following our custom of praying for people in specific vocations, I ask you to pray today for farmers, for all who work the land, that they would labor with an awareness of the bounty of the earth and demonstrate wise and skillful care of its resources. Now I invite you to pray aloud for the burdens and joys, the needs and thanksgivings that are on your heart at this time. And now let's conclude our time of prayer by singing together the prayer our Savior taught us.
All right, well, I've got just two quick announcements, so uh, you can take a seat or stay standing. Uh, Whatever you want to do, I can't see you. Uh, The first thing is this. Our rector, Aubrey Spears, will be returning to worship this next Sunday. Uh, He's going to be starting part-time again. He's not going to be preaching yet. I'm very sorry, but he will be back in worship and starting back part-time. So thank you for your prayers for him, and please continue to pray for the Spears family. And let's just um, follow through on prayer until he is 100% back in the saddle. And then the second thing, I'm really excited to announce that um, we've got uh, Lindy, with Lindy Jenkins' leadership, we've got something wonderful called Arts Incarnates, the um, kind of fullest, latest expression of of the arts ministry here at Incarnation. And uh, it's going to really uh, kind of, um, I don't know, what's the right word? Uh, Pop, explode, sort of begin, celebrate this kind of new chapter with a concert uh, by Delaplane. This is Don Townsend's band on September the 11th. So we'd really encourage you to come. Now, to make this possible uh, so that we can abide by the city's ordinances, you need to reserve a spot. So email arts at the incarnation.org, and then Lindy will respond to you with more information on what you can do. And also the same night, September 11th, that's when our new gallery installation here in the church is going to be there. So you'll get both the new gallery installation and the concert. For questions, just reach out to Lindy at arts at the incarnation.org. That's it. Please stand, and we'll conclude our service together singing, This is My Father's World. been a delight to worship with you this morning. Uh, You remember at the start of the service, I said, if you've got a cross around, find it. And um, so if you've got one now, we're about to point at it. And if you don't have one with you, then feel free to point to this cross just behind me here on your screen. All our problems 
We send to the cross of Christ all our difficulties. We send to the cross of Christ all the devil's works. We send to the cross of Christ and all our hopes. We set on the risen Christ. Now receive this blessing. May Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.